then uh, hello and uh, welcome uh, to all of those who are here with us uh, as we continue our 2021 lecture series in health ethics with an relevant seminar. Uh, this conference is part of the National Health Ethics Week. So my name is Abdul Simon Sangar, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Pragmatic Health Ethics Research Unit based at the RCM. I'm coordinating this series of conferences and I have the honor of acting as a moderator today. So in February, speakers have made us reflect on various topics related to well-being and human flourishing. Carol Reeve taught us that well-being is fundamental to staying healthy. Alain Ehrenberg made the link between human flourishing and autonomy as a form of action and capacity of the individual to act in spite of his mental health problems. Vincent Dumas focused his talk on the meaning of well-being based on his singular and rich experience. Today, we are honored to host Dr. Teresa Burke uh, to talk about COVID-19 and deaf bioethics, language, communication, and accessibility. Uh, Dr. Teresa Blankmeyer Burke is professor of philosophy at Gallaudet University, a bilingual university teaching deaf, hard of hearing, and hearing students in American Sign Language and Written English. She is the only signing deaf philosophy philosopher in the world with a doctorate in philosophy. Her academic publications are in philosophy, bioethics, research ethics, policy, and sign language interpreting ethics. She also writes for the general public, including mainstream media uh, publications, creative nonfiction, and poetry. Dr. Burke has served on a number of national and international committees, including the United Nations World Federation of the Deaf, the American Philosophical Association, and the National Association of the Deaf in the USA. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Burke. Uh, I am let you begin your presentation. Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah. We... I'm so sorry. I'm used to being on Zoom using sign language, so it's not a, a regular habit. Uh, thank you for letting me know. Um, I am very excited to be here, and I'm grateful to be invited. Um, I would like to uh, preface my, my talk by letting you know first that this is a, um, a small part of what has turned into a rather large project. It's actually, I think, in the process of probably becoming a book about deafness and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I am not going to be using any slides. I will be reading or presenting my paper. Um, and this is partly because I'm a philosopher, I'm used to doing things with words, but it's primarily because as the only signing deaf bioethicist on the planet, it's been an extremely busy time during the pandemic responding to different um, countries, national associations for the deaf and different kinds of bioethical issues. So um, I have to prioritize my time in, in ways that we're all very familiar with, uh, with the pandemic. So let me begin. Um, and so far, I don't know if you could show like a, a thumbs up or something. Are you all hearing me okay? Is everything good? Perfect. Okay, I think. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right, so the title of my presentation today is COVID and Deaf Bioethics, Language, Communication, and Accessibility. And I will be sharing with you two sections of this very long project. And these sections are on the question of um, uh, 
the prohibition to not touch your face, which you may remember from early on in the, in the pandemic, social distancing, and then finally the issue of wearing masks and how that impedes communication for the signing deaf population. So, but let me begin with uh, deaf bioethics. So one question that comes up is this, does each disability have its own bioethics? Or maybe what is special about the deaf experience that distinguishes deaf bioethics from disability bioethics? Disability is a multifocal phenomenon. Disabled people have a variety of experiences even when they have the same disability identity. So by adding other identities, gender, age, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and more, it contributes to the uniqueness of each disabled person's experience. So why deaf bioethics? Well, one thing that distinguishes it is the language and the language modality. Signing deaf people use a sign language, such as American Sign Language or in Quebec, uh, LSQ, as a primary means of communication. The language modality is signed, and the language modality of spoken language is, of course, spoken. English and ASL also exist in written modalities. Now, not all deaf people use a sign language. Some deaf people prefer to use spoken language and um, others use sign language and spoken language. I'm one of those. Um, not all people who use sign language are, are deaf. Sometimes you have hearing uh, people who have deaf parents who learn a sign language as their first language. Sometimes you have hearing people who learn a sign language for a variety of reasons. Maybe they wish to be a teacher of the deaf. Maybe they um, interact with deaf people in their business life, number of different reasons, just as people choose to learn spoken languages. So as a signing deaf bioethicist who has devoted several decades to developing a notion of deaf bioethics, I've suggested three different strands of deaf bioethics. One strand focuses on how people might approach the bioethic issues that arise from the experience of a signing deaf community using that sign discourse as a foundation for analysis. So if you're using, if you're a deaf person and you sign, what kinds of things come up in bioethics in this community that you don't see in spoken language communities? A second strand considers what perspectives deaf and hard of hearing people can bring to traditional questions of bioethics. And then the final strand examines novel bioethics issues arising from healthcare and biomedical research specifically targeted at deafness and deaf experiences. And two of these that you may be familiar with are the ethics of co cochlear implant surgery for prelingually deaf children. And then um, now a very hot topic and one that I do research on is genetic engineering for deaf people. Uh, that is to create deaf people or to um, continue to uh, further the population of deaf people through genetic engineering. All right. So the history of deaf and hard of hearing people is substantially intertwined with three professions, education, medicine, and religion. Deaf bioethics operates in this context, and this has been made explicit through the current COVID-19 pandemic. The presentation or paper that I'm, I'm doing today considers the big question of what can we learn from deaf bioethics in this time of the COVID pandemic. And using the lens of deaf bioethics, I analyzed four different aspects of the pandemic public health measures and the impact on the signing deaf community, as well as the non-signing deaf and hard of hearing population. And these four aspects include the admonition not to touch one's face, 
the challenge of mask wearing, which I will talk about today, and then two others that I'm happy to talk about during discussion, but that I don't have time to present, which are the ethical issues around contract contact tracing in the signing deaf community and ethical issues re related to vaccine allocation and prioritization and the signing deaf community. So um, the first section, uh, which I titled the first phase, don't touch your face, wash your hands, distance yourself. Now, when I first started to think about the bioethical issues for signing deaf people, there were three concerns. The don't touch your face message is harder when your language involves touching your face repeated times. And deaf people were pushing back against this messaging as AUDIST, that's spelled A-U-D-I-S-T. And it is similar to the concept of ableism, which is discrimination against deaf people, against signing deaf people. And the key thing here, I think, is context. So the vast majority of hearing non-signers in the US, and I venture to say probably also in Anglophone Canada, usually do not have a deep knowledge of what it means to signing deaf people to be constantly fending off attempts to modify and tinker with your language. English and American Sign Language are different languages, but they exist on a continuum. And by that, I mean, you have manual systems of English that go all the way over into American Sign Language, which is a manual language used with their hands. So um, one analogy might be to think about Spanglish. Um, my family speaks Spanish, so I, I can go be between English and Spanish. I imagine maybe there's something similar uh, with French and English. And here you have um, two languages with a contact point and they get inflected by each other. But in the context of Spanglish, which involves two spoken languages, English and Spanish, each one of these languages is recognized as a language in its own right and each has a different role in the colonization of people as languages that colonize. Now, some people might argue that American Sign Language is a colonizing language given the power of sign languages to shape deaf lives, but um, I think that's a, a harder argument to make. So you have this notion of colonizing languages and you also have the history of deaf education. So natural sign languages have for over 300 years been replaced in educational settings by sign systems. And this goes all the way back to 18th century uh, Paris. And it, these system, systematized attempts to codify a sign language are, um, there's a number of different attempts, but this has uh, become a fight where there is a deaf educational space where people are using the natural sign language, except in the classroom where there has been this systematic approach. And it's complicated because the people who credential teachers and other educators require mastery of the dominant spoken language through writing. And here's the, the crux of the problem for the deaf community in the US, but this is also something that applies internationally. If deaf children are taught through a mixture of two languages rather than one language and the other, what happens is the grammatical systems of each language do not get passed along. So this interferes with language mastery. And this is very important because if you're communicating public health messages and you're using one language or the other, it becomes much more complicated when you are communicating to a population that may not have one full um, 
coherent language. So um, people who become deaf professionals fall into several different groups. And these are the people who are often advising the public health messaging. They may be people who originally were deaf, uh, oral deaf or hard of hearing. They use their residual hearing to acquire the spoken language and then later pick up sign language. Uh, there may be people who become deaf later in life and they already have one language that's full and coherent and they have access to that they use to scaffold as they learn a sign language. And then you have people who had deaf parents and they modeled the natural language of the sign la American sign language. And so you have here people who already had full access to one language, but with the signing deaf community, there are many, many people who have never had full access to one language. And this is part of the challenge of public health communication. Now, it's not just a matter of language colonization. Uh, deaf people's bodies have long been a focus of medical attention. Now, this starts with deaf children and language deprivation. Um, and once um, the caregivers of deaf children, infants, toddlers, notice that the child does not respond, um, they, they enter a system, the medical system, and sometimes they get cochlear implants, sometimes they, they are given the opportunity to learn a sign language. But in any case, the, the challenge again is this full access to language. So now we're in a pandemic and we're um, we're in this medical complex, which is inhabited primarily by culturally hearing non-signing people. And they're pushing out this message, messages. So what's the response from the grassroots signing deaf community? Well, it's suspicion. If a profession such as medicine has been systematically organized in order to eradicate deafness as part of the mission, and which means to eradicate your community and your language, it's very easy to be suspicious of any new messages emerging from them, even if the messages are not targeted specifically at your community, but as people as a whole. Um, so in uh, the beginning of the pandemic, there were many, many video uh, blogs and commentary on social media in a variety of sign languages about this reluctance to change the behavior of touching your face just because hearing people said you should do it. And I'm going to explain why. So for hearing people who don't sign, the message don't touch your face in non-ritualized social context, it's an inconvenience. Maybe this makes you aware of a manual tick, like you might touch your face uh, when you're nervous or other things. And perhaps you're made aware, for example, of certain rituals, like a religious ritual that involves a gesture of touching your, your forehead as you cross, covering your eyes when saying the Shema or the blessing over the Shabbat candles. And these gestures can be done without touching the face. And one presumes that the religious meaning is not invalidated. But now let's take the example of trying to touch your face, the habit of face touching from one act or one uh, ritualized uh, experience and to do it in the everyday course of using your language, which has hundreds, if not thousands of words that involve touching your face. So the sign for knowledge, the sign for tomorrow, um, the sign for yes, I know, I don't mind. And you couple these linguistic habits with pride. So sometimes you have variations in signing that underscore your um, cultural roots or a sense of belonging and your affiliation with different identity communities. So it becomes even more complicated because in addition to that, now we have 
the signing deaf community and how you enter into that community, which I talked about a little bit before. So sometimes you can enter the community from birthright, you have deaf parents. Sometimes you go to a residential school for the deaf when you are very young and you have a native signer's affect. But sometimes you learn as a, an adult. And if you are a, uh, for example, white deaf person with deaf parents and maybe deaf grandparents and great grandparents, in, in some ways you have a lot of social capital to expend. So if you modify your signing to not touch your face, people may notice it, but it won't pull down your social standing because it's clear that you know the language and you're choosing to alter it for whatever reason. However, if you are a new signer and your signing is already inflected with mistakes and English interference, and you sign in a way that differs from the standard mainstream ASL, it will be noted. Now, people might think, oh, well, they're changing the signing because they're complying with public health advice. But another explanation, and these two are not mutually exclusive, is that um, one might be interpreted as having not only uh, an agreement or support of public health advice, but as having an allegiance with the medical community. And again, in the signing deaf community, given the historical context, this can be problematic. So um, how can it be problematic? Maybe you're, you get excluded from further communication. Maybe you are um, uh, not invited into certain kinds of um, public or social events. So there's ways of um, excluding people. And then by that exclusion, you don't have access to the information. And that's the key during a pandemic when we're trying to communicate vitally important pieces of information. All right. Um, now I'm going to move to hand washing. So it isn't just that um, not touching your face is a public health message, but there was this big campaign and still exists of telling people to wash their hands. And I don't think that there's uh, the same kind of resonance of value and inclusion and exclusion with hand washing. But one of the uh, pieces of advice that was given, at least in the States, I don't know if it was also popular in Canada, so I hope you can inform me, was to um, count off the 20, 30 seconds for washing your hands by singing a song. Now, uh, the relationship of deaf people to music is very complicated, and um, it doesn't mean that deaf people can't appreciate music, but the advice was using an auditory device and that reinforces the hearing culture's norms and assumptions. So in the signing deaf community, again, it's like, well, is this for us? I mean, this seems to be a, a hearing people thing. There's also the, the mental uh, uh, contradiction. So if you are a person who has a, uh, background knowledge of some songs and you know the words and you can mentally maybe sing it to yourself, but you also sing it with your hands. And if you're washing your hands, your hands are, are in this little bit of a war where you're, you're signing and then you're washing and it becomes very discombobulating. So, so that is another part of, of this. And one suggestion is that if public health messaging is to be truly inclusive, it ought to consider that providing cultural touchstones such as the ABC song or the happy birthday song uh, can exclude people, whether that's deaf people through the sense of hearing or immigrants or other members of marginalized cultural communities. So my recommendation is that it's important to confer with these various communities and figure out how to get out this message using cultural references from these communities. And now I'm moving on to social distancing. So deaf social distancing 
is not hearing social distancing. I'm looking at time. Okay, I think I'm good. So when when I was a child, and this is a the paper has a little bit of memoir, so I hope you'll indulge me with this. Um, I, I was reading my mother's college anthropology textbook, and I came across this word proxemics, and it helped me understand the difference between my mother's family, which gestured and touched often, and they were very close in space, and my father's family, which was much more reserved, and people stood further apart. Well, as a hard of hearing child, I had figured out the closer I could stand to someone, the more likely it would be that I could understand them because I was depending on my ears, not my eyes so much. So and this had practical implications. I think I was given leeway because I was hard of hearing. So from my mother's family, I learned that people who spoke Spanish were of Lebanese heritage or who came from the Hawaiian islands were easier to understand. There was just a lot more on the face that I could read. And my father's family, which was Germanic, people would st stand further apart. And they were, a lot of the elders were hard of hearing, but they didn't, um, they didn't add gesture. They just raised their voices. So when I started to hang out with people who were deaf, who signed, and I entered this community as a young adult at 18, 16, I learned the rules for how close you could be were different. So if I were meeting, say, a hearing person for dinner, the rule would be that we would um, maybe share a corner, sit ne near each other, especially hard of hearing, but uh, because you'd be closer, you could hear more. And if you were with a deaf person, you look for the table with the best lighting and to sit directly across from each other. Now, the, the message of social distancing, as I mentioned, has a hearing cultural center, not a deaf one. So the nature of sign language is a little bit different. Deaf people tend not to stand that close to each other. Six feet, which is the recommended, sorry for using the um, US measurements uh, in meters, what would that be like roughly three meters? I don't know, no, two, I don't know. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, um, so in, if you are not culturally used to standing close to each other, the message don't stand close doesn't really make sense. The other part of it was that um, you may remember the World Health Organization graphics, and they showed this visual of two people here, one's breathing, there's a little aerosol. And um, so what causes respiratory droplets? Well, sometimes it's coughing or, or sneezing, but there's also the idea of spoken language. So if people are signing and they're not speaking, that's a different kind of context. Now, I have a caveat, which is sometimes in spoken language, you have a mouth movement. Now, it's not necessarily that you're mouthing the words in, that are signed in American Sign Language, you're not mouthing them in English, but there may be certain kinds of signs that have a mouth movement. And I'll show you one. This is, if this movement is uh, associated with this sign, which means I've done it, accomplished, which I'll do at the end of my talk, right? Ah, I'm done. And so there can be times where deaf people have a particular expiration of respiratory droplets, but it's different than in the spoken language community. So we don't have data on this. And it might be that some of the hearing cultural assumptions are the minimum guidelines, but maybe in a signing deaf space, you need to adjust that and, and uh, optimize things. And this ties to the next part of my talk, which has to do with mask wearing. So there's a lot of literature on uh, now, a lot of people are writing about um, the challenges of wearing masks for deaf and hard of hearing people, especially people who speech read, because if you have, and I have my prop here, the mask, you cannot see the lips, you cannot understand what's being said. We do have different things like apps on cell phones, but it's a very challenging time and it's a scary time. So 
I use speech reading, by the way, because it isn't just that you're reading lips. You're looking at um, the face muscles um, and the throat and the whole body when you, when you speech read. So some of the challenges for mask wearing for speech readers are that um, if you have two people, both are wearing masks, one person is using a spoken language to communicate with a deaf or hard of hearing person who can't access the language because it's not visible. Um, and it is also tied to speech reading is not just the one-on-one, -on -one. it's the entire context. And forgive me for signing, it's, it's natural to me. Um, if you have people in a room and they all react in the same way. Let's say you're in a restaurant and all of a sudden people do this and you see a little mouth movement or you see body language. Maybe that's because a server uh, waiter has dropped a tray full of plates and it's made a loud noise. If you are at an airport and you um, see with your eyes, people go, ah. Oh but you can't because there's no mask, then you could maybe assume pre-pandemic as a deaf person, if I see that, I say, oh, my flight's been delayed. So conversations in many settings, spoken language conversations are scripted enough so deaf and hard of hearing people can anticipate what's being asked of them. If you're going into a physician's office, you know you're going to give your name, the time of your appointment, maybe show your insurance and the name of the physician. If you're um, in a medical setting and you're getting an X-ray, you might have to hold your breath. And so there, there's all of these scripted interactions that you can usually predict. And it's a strategy deaf people use. So how do we take the strategy and incorporate it into our public health communication is a question, excuse me. I'm not used to talking. I'm used to talking with my hands. So my throat's a little dry. All right. So when you add mass to the mix, even if you have the scripts that you normally use as a deaf person, what you're doing is you've increased the amount of labor that's pushed on the deaf person. And I think as a general point, something that's really valuable to remember is during the pandemic, it has uh, shown a very bright light on the existing inequities. And I, I would argue this includes the inequities of the signing deaf population. So when deaf people are interacting with people who wear masks using a spoken language, the deaf person has taken on this labor of helping that hearing person through the communication interaction. Why is that? The deaf person is already familiar with how to interact in this situation because they've encountered it multiple times. The hearing person may not have yet encountered a deaf or hard of hearing person while they've been wearing a mask. The other thing is the management of emotional responses. We're in a time where people are much, um, uh, the, there are shorter fuses, people are much more likely to respond with an emotional, um, perhaps an angry response, <clears throat> and they may be less open to figuring out novel encounters, such as how to communicate with a deaf or hard of hearing person who is struggling to understand. So deaf people have uh, some strategies if they use a spoken language. One strategy is to ask someone to lower their mask briefly but not everyone's willing to do that. And it's understandable where they might not be. Another strategy is to use a text app, such as one on the phone, where you can read what someone has said, but these have limitations because they're not 100% accurate. And if the other person is speaking through a mask, that can alter the signal, further decreasing accuracy. A different approach that is more accurate, but more labor intensive, 
is to ask the person to type into their phone or to yours. Now this, of course, it does shift from spoken language to text, but it means that both people in the party must be literate and that's not always the case. Um, sorry, I lost my place for a second. Okay. So you can see that how the, the basic messaging of public health measures have these oldest implications built in. Um, with mask wearing and sign language, there are other issues. You have, um, I'll give you a scenario a pre-COVID scenario and then the post-COVID scenario. So a couple of years ago, I was at a museum enjoying an exhibit. Uh, the museum did not have clear signage. And so there was a security guard position to help alert people they should go this way, not that way. And as luck would have it, and the security guard alerted people by voice, which doesn't work for me. So I went down the wrong hallway the guard called after me, which I did not hear. I continued to walk. I noticed there was a person further down the hallway with sort of a perplexed expression on her face. And that expression gave me a cue because I am familiar with um, when to pay attention to things visually. So I look around, there's the guard, and this is in the US. Um, he has his hand on his weapon. He's ready to draw it. And I immediately go into a very reflexive, uh, accommodating position. I smile, I say, I'm sorry. I point to my ears. And uh, once I did that, everything relaxed. Pre-COVID. Now, imagine the scenario with one difference. Maybe we're in a hospital. So here you have a person walks down the hallway Somebody standing in front of me, but they have a mask on, so I can't read their expression. I don't have the cue. The guard is behind me calling. I don't hear it. The guard interprets my behavior as deviant, as defiant, and reacts accordingly, possibly drawing a weapon and endangering my life. And I've had guns drawn on me for being hard of hearing. It's not an unusual experience, but it doesn't happen all that regularly. I don't have a chance to show a smile, you know, in um, because I'm mass. And so the opportunities for having these little nonverbal exchanges that communicate friendliness, unthreatening behavior do not exist with mass. Now, I think this is a public health issue that has to be addressed. It's prior to COVID had been a problem mostly restricted to law enforcement settings where deaf individuals, almost always deaf men of color, were perceived as suspects. And because they did not respond, they didn't hear the words to put their hands up or to go down on their knees, the, um, the deaf person would then be wrestled to the ground, handcuffed, meaning you can't sign, and if they don't have voice privileges, such as I do, the, the sounds that the deaf person makes would be incoherent and they might be presumed to be um, high on some kind of um, mind altering substance. So with this, you have now, not just the, the population, which horribly has been experiencing this, but it gets broadened to a much larger segment of the, the signing deaf community. I want to talk about one other thing. I see that I have five minutes left. And again, I'm taking this 40 page paper and condensing it. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about education. We've had a lot of discussion about how to continue education during the pandemic when there is risk of COVID transmission. In the case of the signing deaf community, you have two big issues that have to be considered. One is for young children who have yet to be 
exposed to a full language. So that is a signed language. If they are pulled out of school and they're attending school on Zoom on a screen where the three-dimensional language is now shifted to a two-dimensional language, there are opportunities for language acquisition in a community that already has severe numbers of um, language deprivation has gone way down. So this is an equity issue. Um, and it's an equity issue that attaches to citizenship later on, because if that child does not acquire language at the right uh, point in time when that language acquisition window is open, they will um, be impacted throughout their life. So that's one issue. The other issue is how do you um, communicate in a mask wearing environment in an educational setting. At um, many deaf schools, teachers and interpreters uh, and other staff are wearing masks that are clear so that you can see the lips, you can see the mouth movement associated with particular signs. But this is a good idea in theory. It doesn't work so well in practice. The masks tend to fog up. The, um, the mask also will hide certain per certain angles of seeing the sign. And then people don't like wearing the mask because it is not as comfortable. Um, so here at Gallaudet, we all have the clear masks, but it's rare to see people using them outside of the classroom setting. And so you adjudicate this triad of safety, ease of communication, and comfort. The mask wearing is required by public health order, but people are deprioritizing um, informal communication and only wearing the mask during the formal communication settings of classroom instruction and perhaps meetings. So this has an impact, one minute more, this has an impact of affecting the informal interaction, which also goes to impact the informal um, social glue that keeps us together as a society. If you cannot understand the message because the sign, grammar, and syntax, and whether something's an adjective or has been negated is missing, you only get so much information on the hands how does this then impact the community? The burden, and I'll just, I'll wrap it up here. So the burden of communication has never been solely on deaf people, but it's been presumed to be. The pandemic has unmasked the fact that we usually do most of the work for you. And now we can't. And so there needs to be an effort on the part of hearing people in public health communication in particular to come together. And with that, I'll conclude my talk. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Burke, for this informative uh, presentation, which allow us to better understand the impact of COVID-19 on the deaf community. Uh, please, uh, people uh, participant using signing language can activate their camera uh, to ask their questions, and uh, Dr. Beck will answer them directly. Uh, you, can, so you can also use the Q&R function uh, to ask your question. Uh, before I... Uh, uh, I let the participants uh, uh, ask their question. I just uh, have uh, one question for you, Dr. Beck, if you allow. Oh. Uh, uh, how is privacy and confidentiality addressed in a telemedicine setting for deaf people with chronic health problems with physicians who are not familiar with sign language? Uh, mm -hmm. Should the IT engineer be present? Should, should the translator be allowed and how do you think this situation should be handled? Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you. So I want to make sure I understand this um, correctly. Are you asking about um, the privacy and confidentiality yeah. with an interpreter present, a sign language interpreter present? Exactly. Then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So um, for the most part, uh, in countries where there is regulation of sign language interpreters, they are bound to a code of ethics. In the US, it's the uh, Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. In Canada, it's the um, AVLIC. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember what it stands for, but it's a group regulatory body for sign language interpreters. And in that, there is a um, uh, in this code of ethics, there are expectations of confidentiality. And with that, um, there's the, so that's, that's the rule and the structure. I have written a, a bit about this in the past. So one of the challenges is that um, the signing deaf community is very small and sign language interpreters are often part of this community. So there's a healthy suspicion in the community that depending on who your interpreter is, they can, um, maybe they show up at your medical appointment. Maybe they also show up at your workplace and maybe they show up at your child's school. So the interpreter can acquire a lot of information about you. And that can sometimes feel quite, um, inhibiting and can constrain what you may be willing to share with as a deaf person with your physician. So um, even though you have this requirement of confidentiality, the small size of the community is sometimes a little bit of a barrier to that communication. Now with telemedicine, um, we had a series of regulation issued during the pandemic that um, manage the challenge of what happens when you pull in that third party. And um, the, I'm sorry, it's been a little while since I've looked at these regulations, but what, what was, uh, one result was they just suspended the um, pri HIPAA privacy um, requirements for the approved providers of telemedicine because the demand was just so huge. And I don't, I have to look at what's happening now, but I don't think that they've stopped the suspension of those, those requirements. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Um, we have a question from uh, uh, Marlon. Uh, maybe this you... Do you, do you use a language, a signing language, or do you just want to ask a question? I let you ask your question, Marlon. Is a question, yeah? question coming in sign language or in uh, written English? I don't know here. Marlon uh, is still muted. Yeah. So you need to open up your microphone and unmute yourself to ask your question. Maybe we can uh, just take the uh, Monique Lacroix, uh, Lanois yeah, uh, questions and uh, uh, yeah, go Monique back. Lanois. Yeah. Monique Lanois. See it now. Um, okay. All right. Um, so thank you for bringing up the issue of intersectionality as the reaction to a person who is behaving in a deviant manner is you know, racialized and, and gendered, as you pointed out. I have a neighbor who um, has low vision. So he goes around with a, a um, I guess an ID on his jacket that says low vision, which is helpful. However, it, it's kind of an, it, like would have, 
it's sort of an issue of privacy at the same time is that he has to announce to everybody that he has low vision because we're always in an ableist framework. Mm -hmm. So I find that a bit distressing, although for him, it's been useful, but it's always, as you pointed out, you know, the ableist uh, community than the the other individuals who don't fit into that norm have to kind of do a kind of labor, as you mentioned. Yes, yes. Yes, um, thank you for that comment. Um, so I, I do think you're absolutely right. This can be an issue of privacy. It can also be an issue of safety. So um, there are some deaf people who are very, uh, they're, they're quite comfortable with having like, for example, if you're a bicyclist, they put on a little vest and on the, the back of the vest is the symbol of an ear with the international no, the circle with the line through it to let people know that they don't hear. Um, and I have seen people wear this also while hiking or walking. But it strikes me as perhaps um, maybe not so much with the bicycle, but if you're walking and you have a symbol that you don't hear, it's like telling people, you can sneak up on me from behind and I won't hear a thing. And so this question of safety and privacy and intersectionality definitely all comes together in ways that it's important to think through because the consequences could be um, quite horrific if the wrong kind of response is made. Thank you so much for that example. It's illuminating to see a different disability example make the point of how uh, medicine and public health is very centered on the ableist uh, viewpoint. Do we have another question? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think Maureen uh, may have some uh, uh, technical issues. Uh, oh. I don't know. Maureen? Um, is it possible to type the, the question? It may not be, depending on, you know, again, um, if the technical issues. Maybe. All right. Okay. So maybe uh, I have a question if we okay. have a bit of time. The conference series is about human flourishing, mm. which is uh, an interesting uh, concept quite mm -hmm. fundamental in ethics. What yes. are your views on this idea of human flourishing? Do you see it as interesting, as sometimes problematic because of the ways we envision human flourishing yeah. sometimes yeah. in maybe, uh, I would say maybe oddest kinds yeah. of ways? Thank you for that question. Um, as it happens, I've been for the last few years working on a monograph on deaf flourishing. And um, I don't think that deaf flourishing is all that different from other ways of flourishing. And I think there are many ways that human beings can flourish. But I think one key component that is often overlooked in, uh, like if you look at the capabilities literature or some of the literature on well being, the notion of access to a language, to a full language is typically overlooked. Now, maybe this isn't surprising because if you are a hearing person, you uh, acquire language very naturally. It's not something you have to fight to do. But for, for signing deaf people um, and for many deaf people who are born deaf or who acquire their deafness at a very early age, the um, access to a full language, one that is complete in structure and grammar and syntax, such as American Sign Language, can be a part of life that is ultimately very enriching and is a ticket to other aspects of life. 
So I begin my, my depth flourishing project with this, this point about language. And then I look at the ways in which um, oddest assumptions about what counts as well being are modified or can be pushed back against from this signing deaf perspective. I hope that helps to at least begin to answer your, your question. I see maybe we have two things in the chat. No, maybe not. No, those okay. were old and so. Uh, Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, answer. I think it, this is very interesting and I hope to learn more about this. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, thank you to all the, the participants. Um, we have uh, uh, another, our last uh, conference. Uh, it is on uh, December 2nd by, uh, it, it will be, a, uh, it, will, it will take the form of a, a panel uh, presented on December 2nd by the panelists, uh, the following panelists, uh, Richard Mira. Dr. Hubert Doucet, Aude Bandini, Clara Dallaire, and, and myself. Uh, the panelists uh, for the, the last conference is, uh, uh, we will um, discuss, uh, will reflect on well being, health, and human flourishing in the context of health ethics. And uh, the talk will be in French. Uh, just uh, some words in French. Donc, uh, La, le, la dernière conférence prendra la forme d'un panel qui se tiendra le, le 2 décembre euh, prochain. Et euh, les panélistes qui, euh, qui vont prendre part à, à cette... Euh, les panélistes seront Richard Méran, euh, Monsieur Richard Méran, les docteurs Hubert Doucet, euh, Aude Bandini, Clara Dallaire et, et moi-même. Donc, euh, on, ils vont réfléchir sur euh, euh, le bien-être, la santé et... Euh, et l'épanouissement humain en contexte d'éthique de la santé. Donc, la présentation, le panel sera en français. Pour les attestations, les étudiantes et étudiants de l'Université de Montréal peuvent prendre contact avec Mariana Correro ou Ariane Quintal. Donc, voilà. Uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Burke, for your presentation. And uh, thank you to all the participants. Okay, thank you very much. I just put in the chat that I'm very happy to share a copy of my draft paper if anybody wishes to, to read it. I will put my email in there as well so you can just reach out to me directly. And I, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want me to uh, stay online or? Oh.